Hello. I think that we need to get the brain stimulated, so I'm going to start with a pop quiz. All right, and uh, the winner of the pop quiz is going to get a wonderful prize that I believe is in this bag. Is this the bag? This is, I've been told, and it's beautiful, but you can't see it, but it is a tote bag, or a gym bag that is worth 20,000, what? Not, not dollars. <laughs> but close to like $400. Anyway, you can come up and see it. It's beautiful. And it's, and it's, it's really elaborate. And I'm going to drop it off. the. T okay. So whoever wins the pop quiz wins this wonderful prize. So in order to do the pop quiz, what I'm going to do, there's a handout that I believe that you all have. There are six questions on that handout. And I'm also going to have them up on the screen. And so let me just explain to you how this will work. Everyone will stand up, and I will read the question. For example, motivation is, and you have four choices. A, a skill. B, inherited. C, like intelligence. One either has it or they don't. D, all of the above. And when I say go, you will yell out your answer. If you get it right, you stay standing, and you're still, you know, in line to win the prize. If you get it wrong, you sit down. All right, so would everyone stand up? Last person standing will win the prize. So everyone, please stand up. Everyone stand up. So when you're ready, and I say go, I want you to yell out the answer to question number one. Is it A, B, C, or D? And the answer is A, a skill. So if you got that right, stay standing. If you got it wrong, sit down. Okay, everybody got it right? Okay, all right, I'm trusting you, all right? Okay, so let's look at question number two. The three psychological needs required by every human being to thrive, regardless of gender, generation, or race, are A, autonomy, mastery, and purpose, B, mastery, membership, and meaning, C, autonomy, relatedness, and competence. D, all of the above. And just a minute, just a minute. Let people think about it. Okay, okay, okay. Yell it out. C. The answer is C. I did hear some Cs. Oh, but we did lose a few people on that one. Okay, here's number three. Common practices that undermine people's psychological needs are... A, applying pressure and demanding accountability. B, ignoring feelings. C, discounting learning. D, all of the above. And your answer is? D, all of the above. We lost a few people on that one. Okay. Okay, we're getting down to it. Okay, question number four. Although you all are doing very well, I must say. Managers cannot motivate people because... A, they don't have enough resources. B, people are already motivated. C, they don't have the skills. D, all of the above. And your answer is? I think there's some people that are going to disagree with this one, but this is really why I'm here today. People are already motivated. Okay. I can see a number of people in the audience who are getting this right is because they've read my book. <laughs> I'm not sure it's fair. Okay, five, a best practice that helps people shift to an optimal motivational outlook is or are praising, B, status building, C, framing deadlines as information rather than a form of pressure, or D, all of the above. Interesting. Framing debt is C. Did anyone get that right? But I mean, I, somebody who's already standing. <laughs> okay, so you all got that right? See? Okay, so we have one more, and, and, and I have a tie-breaking question if we have a tie. All right? So let's try number six. Viable strategies for self-regulation include A, personal incentives and rewards. B, promoting mindfulness, aligning with values, and connecting to purpose. 
C, competition and treating work like a game to be won. D, all of the above. And your final answer is? Wow, look at all the people we still have standing. So, um, is there anyone still standing that is wearing any form of purple? Any form of purple? Anyone? Where, who? I see a hand. If you're not wearing purple, sit down, please. <laughs> if you have some kind of purple on, stay standing. <gasps> Is there anyone with purple? <gasps> My gosh, come on up. And congratulations, and why don't you tell people who you are? Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Ruby Dial. And I'm from Blanchard International. <laughs> Not sure that's fair. <laughs> Thank you. Now, you might know that there was some method in my madness with that whole contest. And so it wasn't just about the prize or it wasn't just about the pop quiz. I would really like for you to think about your reaction and how you felt as soon as I announced we're having a pop quiz. And then I want you to think about how you felt when I said, stand up. And then I want you to think about how you felt when you started yelling out the answer and you got it right or you got it wrong until we finally had the winner of the prize. All right? Now, I'm going to ask you to think about your experience. And your experience will be reflected in some of these statements. Let me just move this. Let's see. So every time you see a statement that reflects how you felt, I would like for you to raise your hand. Or if you don't want to raise your hand, just raise your eyebrows, because I can see. Okay? All right. So for example, if you don't like quizzes, I hate quizzes, maybe because I'm not good at them, then you could raise, thank you, so we already have people raising their hands, okay? And here, I see some eyebrows, okay? So every time there's a statement that might be true for you, raise your hand or an eyebrow, all right? I could have cared less about this quiz. In fact, I didn't even try to answer them. I just waited for the time to be up so we could move on. Okay, thank you. The only reason I even tried to play along is because you asked me to. Okay, thank you. By the way, thank you. In fact, I rather resent that you made me engage in this quiz. It felt like a waste of time. Thank you. Good. I love honesty. I tried hard because I wanted to beat everyone else. Okay, that gives me a little bit of insight into this group. <laughs> okay. I tried hard because I wanted to win the prize. <laughs> that tells me even more about this group. Okay. I was disappointed in myself for not getting all the answers correct. Wow, interesting. Okay. It would have been a better experience if I had gotten all the answers correct. Okay. I love quizzes, even though I'm not good at them. Wow, interesting. I love quizzes, and I did well. Okay, good. I enjoy quizzes like this because one of my values is exercising my brain through mental challenges. All right. Now, I don't know if you all noticed. I sure obviously did from up here. We had a hand or some eyebrows go up for every single one of those statements. And each one of those statements reflects a different way of being motivated. What we know through the science of motivation is that there's not just one form of motivation. People are motivated or they're not. But in fact, there are six different ways of being motivated. And we've captured them in the spectrum of motivation model. I'm going to be giving you a handout in a little bit that actually has this model in it. But I just want to um, get you uh, to understand conceptually what this model is really all about. See, there were some of you who were disinterested in that opening activity. You had the disinterested motivational outlook that's represented by the red bubble. You didn't care. You found no value, no meaning in it. A lot of the people in your workplace are disinterested. Many times they're disinterested because they're overwhelmed. 
They don't know what to do next. They can't cope or they don't have the skills to cope with ambiguity. So if you're going through massive change, if you're merging, you're acquiring, or there's just fast pace of change, people will feel disinterested. They can't cope. When people can't find meaning or they're overwhelmed, they're disinterested. The external motivational outlook, if you really wanted to win the prize and then you were disappointed that you didn't win the prize, that's the external motivational outlook. The external motivational outlook is when we're motivated by something outside of ourselves or something outside of the task itself. It's when we want the tangible or the intangible rewards. The tangible rewards might be a prize, incentive, bonus, money. Intangible rewards might be power, status, image. The imposed motivational outlook, you might have had that one when I said stand up and you felt like you had to. You felt like everyone else around you was standing up and you didn't want to be different. You were afraid of what might, uh, people might think of you if you didn't participate. So the imposed motivational outlook is any time you hear yourself saying, oh, I have to do this. I have to do this activity. I have to go to this meeting. Have you ever done that? Where you actually send out the meeting maker and then the time comes for the meeting and you go, oh, I have to go to that meeting. You imposed it on yourself. The imposed motivational outlook is any time we're doing something out of pressure or feeling like we have to or because we're afraid of disappointing someone, including ourselves. Now, what the science says is that those three motivational outlooks, the disinterested, the external, and the imposed motivational outlooks are significantly different than the blue, purple, or violet bubbles. The aligned motivational outlook is what maybe um, you had this attitude of, I don't know what this quiz is all about, but I love learning. I have a value around learning. So you engaged. Maybe the uh, integrated motivational outlook is one you had where you said, you know what, I don't know what this is all about, but I have this sense of purpose. And my purpose is to make the most of every moment and this is a moment. I'm going to make the most of it. Or the inherent motivational outlook where you're saying, you know what, this is fun. You know, I, I like things like this. I like coming to conferences. I like being a participant. So these are six motivational outlooks that people have every single day. So one of the reasons I was very excited to come to India from San Diego, which is a story in and of itself that someday maybe you will hear, um, but can I just say this, that I had my Indian visa two hours before I got a flight um, from San Francisco yesterday, or what felt like yesterday. Was it yesterday? I don't know when it was. But if it wasn't for the people um, in the Living Media team, Perna and her group, I would not be standing here. So I'm optimally motivated to be here. But the real message that I um, wanted to share with you is that we really need to look at motivation differently. That instead of asking, is a person motivated or not, what we really need to ask is, why is a person motivated? So the question is not if, the question is why. What type of motivation does a person have? Because the type of motivation a person has is going to make all the difference in the world. And I'll share with you what the difference is. But I really want you to understand why this is so important. See, traditional motivation has always said people are either motivated or they're not. Now, think about this, if you would, that as soon as we say a person is not motivated, or they're not very motivated, we're thinking of motivation as a quantity of something that people have. And if we don't think they have enough of it, we feel compelled to give them something to make up for what they don't have, which is where we got into all the incentives and the rewards and thinking we have to bribe people to do whatever we ask them to do. Now, all of that, this traditional motivation, this whole idea of motivation is a quantity, came out of research in the 1930s and 40s. I call it the pecking pigeon paradigm. You can go on YouTube. It's fascinating. You can watch B.F. Skinner in his experiments with pigeons in the 1940s. You will find, if you look it up on the Internet, uh, B.F. Skinner in his white lab jacket, 
and he's looking into the camera, and he's very serious, and he says, I can get this pigeon to do whatever I want it to do in 60 seconds. And in this case, he wants this pigeon to make a 360-degree turn. So here's this pigeon. He's just pecking around. And then as soon as the pigeon goes in the direction that Skinner wants him to go, he's conditioned that when he hears this loud sound and a light bulb goes off, a pellet drops. And the pigeon goes and gets the pellet. And the pigeon's not stupid. I know we might think they are, but birds are actually very intelligent. And he says, oh, wow, pellet when I did this motion. So every time he does this motion, he gets a pellet. And then one time, he does this motion, but there's no pellet. So the pigeon's going, hmm, wonder what happened. And so he's pecking around again, and this time he does this. Ah, pellet. Cool. Okay, that means I have to go further. Pellet. Then he doesn't get the pellet, and then he goes a bit further, he gets a pellet. As you can get the picture, within 60 seconds, he's doing a full circle. So behavioral scientists reasoned, wow. If we can get a pigeon to do whatever we want him to do just by giving him a pellet, I bet it'll work with people. Let's just give people whatever we can and we'll get them to do whatever we want them to do. And guess what? It worked. Or we thought it did. What we're now discovering is that what we thought was working wasn't that there has been great opportunity loss in terms of creativity, innovation. You know, I, I heard the minister talking about, and, and you saw it even in the brand uh, video, everyone's talking about well-being, human well-being. We never really took into account how is the way we're motivating people adding or detracting to their well-being. And what we've discovered is that the reason we have so much absenteeism, the reason we have low productivity, the reason that we have um, a lot of sick days or absenteeism, is be or high turnover, is because people's sense of well-being is threatened. So I'm going to give you more information about that in just a little bit. But I'd like you to be thinking about what do you look at when you say motivating people works? What does work look like? What is it we really want from people? And are we looking at short-term gain or long-term sustainability? What we're finding in our research is even short-term gain is compromised when people are sub-optimally motivated. So the pegging pigeon paradigm, it doesn't work. The research is very clear it doesn't work. And it's never worked the way we thought it did. Because here's one important fact. People are not pigeons. We are motivated by things that are different, richer, more profound than pellets. Here's the experiment that really began to help us understand the true nature of human motivation. These were experiments done by Dr. Edward D.C. from Rochester University. He took a group of people and he gave them this Soma puzzle. It's like a Legos for adults. And you can make all kinds of puzzles from these puzzle pieces. And in the um, uh, Soma, puzzle, uh, Soma puzzle box, there's a brochure that shows all these different puzzles that you can make. So Dr. DC gave people, I'm just going to say, like, in this, this side of the room, you're in a first experiment. And we give you a Soma puzzle. And we also give you this brochure that has all the different puzzles that you could make. And Dr. DC says, okay, you've got 30 minutes. See how many of these puzzles you can solve in 30 minutes and keep track on this tally sheet. So he gives them 30 minutes and they're playing with their puzzles. And the reason they use the Soma puzzle for this experiment is because it's just fun. People really enjoy doing it. So they're playing with their puzzles and they're writing down their results. And at 30 minutes, he comes in, he says, okay, time's up. Please stop. Please hand in your tally sheets. So he collects the results. And then he says, I'm so embarrassed. This is an experiment. I need demographic information. And I forgot the form. I am so sorry. I'll be right back. My office is just around the corner. So he leaves the lab. And this is when the real experiment begins. 
This is when the hidden cameras come on, and they observe what these people are doing now that the experiment is over. And what they're discovering is that these people are still playing with their Soma puzzles, because they're fun. And they're talking to each other, and they're saying, wow, how did you do number three? Well, you did number seven? I tried. I couldn't get it. And so they're, co they're collaborating, and they're talking, and they're still having fun. Okay, same experiment, different group of people here. Same instructions. Here's your Soma puzzle. Here's the brochure. Here's your tally sheets. See how many uh, puzzles you can come up with in 30 minutes. Oh, there was one difference. We'll give you $1 for every puzzle you solve. All right? So 30 minutes, they're doing their puzzles. They're writing their results down. As soon as they're done, 30 minutes, they, uh, Dr. DC says, okay, um, give me your tally sheets. And he says, wow, you guys did right. Here's your money. Oh, I'm so embarrassed. I forgot the, the demographic form. I'll be right back. He leaves the laboratory. The hidden cameras come on. And what do they notice these people are doing with their Soma puzzles? What are they doing? Nothing. Yeah, and they're not sharing. What are they doing? They're counting their money. Yeah, they're counting their money. And then they start comparing. Wait a minute, you got $5? I only got two. But I did the hard ones. You did the easy ones. And they started complaining. Interesting uh, postscript. Two weeks later, they asked all the participants to come back for a second round. Guess who the only people who came back were? The, the first group, yeah, the non-money. Why? Because these people said it's not worth a dollar a puzzle to come back. See, what we realize through these experiments is that as soon as people start attributing worth, what they're doing, to something outside of the actual task, they lose interest in the actual task. Think about this with your children. Have you ever noticed, what does a two-year-old ask you over and over and over again to the point where you think you want to pull your hair out? What are two-year-olds always asking you? Why? 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 They're always asking why. Now, why are they asking why? Because they love to learn. It is in our nature. We love to learn and grow. So what do we say to them? Oh, you love learning and growing so much. We're going to put you in school. And we're going to evaluate how well you learn. And we're going to give you grades. And we're going to punish you if you do badly. And we're going to reward you if you do well. And what we've effectively done through our education process is rid children of their love of learning. I know parents that have to bribe their kids just to graduate from high school. So something that was natural, something that was in us from the beginning, we have externalized and actually then we have to keep upping the ante. We have to keep giving them more and more and more in order to get them to learn. And then we wonder why people come to work and it's all about pay for performance. It's because that's all they've ever known. All right? So the Soma Puzzle experiments started to shed light on the nature of human motivation. And thousands of these experiments have been done since the 1960s when Dr. Edward Deasy started this process. And that leads to this real frustration that I think maybe many of you had in listening to the finance minister. I was struck by the economy and the way that we're looking at the productivity of people in our organizations. Now, I'd like to make a, 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 a distinction between what we've been doing with motivation and how that leads to disengagement in the workplace. Now, these statistics that you uh, see up here, this is for the American economy, but I've seen it globally, and it's even worse in other parts of the world, that every single year in the American economy, we are losing $350 billion in lost productivity. All right? And this is from people who are suboptimally motivated and become disengaged in the workplace. Each year, we are willing to spend, our organizations are willing to spend $350 billion, so, um, excuse me, three quarters of a billion, so $350 million, wait, I'm going to get my words right, $750 million, three quarters of a billion of dollars to try to fix engagement 
All right. How many of you um, in your organizations have some kind of engagement uh, problem or issue or you're measuring engagement? How many of you actually measure disengagement and engagement? Some of you do? Okay. And here's the thing, is that I talk to executives who are spending tens, hundreds, millions of dollars to try to measure engagement in the workplace and fix it. And when I ask them, where does engagement come from? How do people become engaged? How do people become disengaged? What I realize is that we're spending all of this money on a problem that we don't even understand the root source of. So seven years ago, the Ken Blanchard companies took on a, um, a uh, quest to understand engagement. And as a result, we have won the Cutting Edge Leadership, excuse me, Cutting Edge Research Award in Leadership Development two years in a row. Now, I'd like to just share this, this research with you, and then I want to start to ask you to think about this in your organizations. And I would like to get to some practical and pragmatic solutions for how we can start to do things differently. So, think about coming to Mind Rush. You had to get here, register, find the venue, kind of figure out what sessions you're going to go to or not go to, um, how you're going to network, if there was people here you wanted to meet. And there were feelings that you were feeling either consciously or subconsciously. So the point here is that we are always, all of us, always appraising our situation. We're always thinking about if we're feeling safe or threatened, if we are uh, feeling curious or bored. So we're always going through these, these um, kinds of emotions and thoughts. Now, what we know is that this is a, called the appraisal process, is that we are doing this through our cognition. In other words, we're thinking about how we um, are experiencing things, and we're having emotions about it, how we feel about it. Think about this. Your people at work, every single day when they come to work, are going through this appraisal process. If they work from home, they're, you know, as soon as they turn on their computers in the morning and they look at their inbox, if they're making a phone call to get on a conference call, or they're walking into a meeting, they're going through this appraisal process. Now, they're thinking about it and they're feeling it. Most of the time, it's subconscious, it's not conscious. Which of those two processes processes, do you think has the most impact on the rest of the appraisal process, the way we think about our experience or the way we feel about our experience? Yeah, it's the way it's our emotion. It's the way we feel about things. And yet, if you think about one of the things that it, we, we don't do in the workplace, it's talk about feelings. It's make feelings legitimate. So that's a whole other topic. So... It's primarily people's feelings that lead to their conclusion on whether or not they have a sense of well-being or ill-being. This appraisal process that I have on the screen right now is a positive appraisal process. What a person thought and felt led to the conclusion of well-being. What our research shows is that when people have a sense of well-being in the workplace, it leads to five intentions. All right? What I'd like for you to do right now, just, for, uh, just take a minute, at your tables, I would like for you to just um, explore if you could have the people in your organization have some positive intentions, what would they be? What would you want people in the workplace to have positive intentions to do or to, um, in terms of, of how they would act? I'd like for you each table just to come up with one intention that you most want your people to have in the workplace. Now, go do it. Just talk at your tables. Yeah, just talk at your tables. Come up with one good intention that you want your people to have every day when they come to work. The intention to... You want your people to have the intention to do something.
Now, the reason I ask you this question is not just to get to the answer, but to raise the question, have you really ever th thought about, wow, what is it I really want my people, when they come to work every day, what is it I want from them? Okay? Well, what our research shows is that there are five intentions, and, and tell me if any of these intentions came out of your conversation. When people have a positive appraisal, and they have well-being, they will have an intention to perform at above expected standards. Okay? They will have an intention to stay in the organization. They will have an intention to use discretionary time or effort on behalf of the organization. They will have an intention to endorse your organization. That's kind of like that brand video. One of the KPIs that was mentioned in that video is uh, from a, as a consumer endorsing a product to another consumer. That's one of the intentions that somebody who has a positive appraisal process would have. And then finally, they would have the intention to use organizational citizenship behaviors. You know what, the, you know what those are? I just experienced this not too long ago. I have a niece, and she was working at a popular department store in San Diego called Nordstrom. And Blair worked in the makeup area, but I needed a gift for a friend. And um, so Blair told me she would help me, and it was another part of the store. So we're over in another part of the store, and I find the gift, and Blair is, is taking me to the cash register, um, but she's behind me. And so I'm walking to the cash register, and then I turn around, and all of a sudden, Blair's not behind me. And I notice Blair's back there at a table that had belts on it. But the belts were falling off, and they were on the floor, and they were all disarrayed. And there's Blair picking up belts, putting them on the table, arranging the table. I said, Blair, what are you doing? She goes, this belt table is a mess. I said, Blair, this, isn't, this is not even your department. And I'll never forget, she just stood there and she put her hand on her hip and she says, well, Aunt Susan, it's my store. That's organizational citizenship behavior. When you care enough about where you're working to go beyond what your duty is or go beyond your job or go beyond the expectations and do something on behalf of others, especially the organization. So when people have a positive appraisal process, they have the intention to perform at above expected standards, to um, uh, use discretionary effort on behalf of the organization, to endorse the organization, to stay, to use organizational citizenship behaviors. Now, hopefully all of you wanted those types of intentions for your people. And those intentions, by the way, research shows, are the greatest predictor of behavior. So when people have those intentions, they will then have positive behavior. And that behavior leads to employee work passion or employee engagement. All right. So the point I want to make here is this, that motivation is a skill, and motivation is the skill that leads to engagement over time. So when people have the skill to shift from a suboptimal motivational outlook to an optimal motivational outlook, that is when, over time, they become engaged. So the key to engagement is day-to-day -day motivation. If we stop asking people, are you motivated or are you not, and if we start creating workplaces where people are optimally motivated, then we will actually be fueling employee work passion or employee engagement. So that's, that's our task. That's our challenge. And the question is then, how do we develop that skill? How do we develop that skill in ourselves, and how do we develop it in others? So that is what I'm hoping that we can do um, for the rest of our time here together, is I would like for us to develop part of the skill. It's a, it's a process. We actually have a multi-day training process. But I think that in the next hour, I can give you enough information that you will leave here doing things differently for yourself and as a leader to start this process of having a workforce that's more optimally motivated that could potentially become engaged. So um, I have another handout. Could we just put, give people that handout? I'm not sure. Do we have it? So as they're 
Yeah, they do. So they're passing it out. And this model is going to be on the handout. So you can be taking a, a couple of notes, and then I'm going to be asking you to apply this to yourself. So let's just think right now. If you have a goal, a personal goal, you have something that you're working on, um, maybe it's a quarterly goal, a KPI, uh, or maybe you have someone that you're working with and you're worried about their motivation, you could be thinking about them. I don't care if you're thinking about yourself or them or both, that's fine. And what I'm going to ask you to start to do is to think about your motivational outlook and their motivational outlook and what the implications for that is, all right? So your, your handout is coming. They're coming from the back. So what you'll be noticing is on the model, on the model, you're going to notice that the bottom half, the three motivational outlooks that are disinterested, external, and imposed are suboptimal. And the three on top, the aligned, integrated, and inherent, are optimal. Now, what's the difference? Okay, so what? So what if we have six different ways of being motivated? What's the difference? Well, suboptimal motivational outlooks are like the fast food of motivation. Now, I use French fries here, but think of whatever your favorite junk food is. All right, what is your favorite junk food? And think about how when you're really hungry, you're tired or you're nervous, and so you need some junk food, right? And what happens to your blood sugar? It spikes, right? You get all this burst of energy. And then what happens? You crash. And when you crash, you go to a point even lower than where you started, all right? Suboptimal motivation is the same way. The reason you have to keep paying people so much more money, give them so many more rewards, give them so many more incentives, keep giving them prizes, run contests, every time you do that, it's like giving them a shot of junk food motivation. Then they crash, and then you've got to give them something else, and you've got to give them something else. It's like when you have to have that caffeine in the afternoon. So this type of motivation is what we want to avoid if we can. I'm not saying don't pay people, okay? So here's the thing. Does money motivate people? Yeah. Does pressure motivate people? Yeah. Does status motivate people? Yes. What I need for you to start to think about is what is the quality of the motivation that people have when that's their motivation? See, we need to pay people fairly because that is part of justice, and that's going to play a big, a big role here in motivation. But money is not why people do what they do. They deserve the money because it's a matter of justice and fairness. All right? But we don't want that to be the reason that people are motivated. Being aligned, integrated, and inherent is what we call optimal motivation. This is the, alter the healthy alternative. It's not like you eat a piece of broccoli and go, mm, 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 that's so wonderful and I just have all this energy. Or you eat this salad and you go, whoa, now I'm ready for the day. It's more long term. You know, and like um, health food, maybe a little bit more challenging to prepare or to think about. But it really does make a difference. Now, the thing is, too, that the research is now showing, actually, that it's not even long-term. Even in the short term, the um, uh, healthy alternative gives you better creativity and innovation, even in the, in the uh, short term. But then you also get sustainable effort. You get sustainable energy when people are motivated through values or through purpose or through enjoyment. So... We really want people to be able to shift from suboptimal to optimal, and we want to create workplaces where people are more likely to be optimally motivated. Here are a few statistics. There are thousands of these studies, but I just uh, selected these because they were published in Harvard Business Review last year. But I, I literally have handbooks full of these kinds of studies with these results. But I think you'll find this interesting that when people have the characteristics of being optimally motivated, 
compared to people who are suboptimally motivated in the workplace, they will have 31% higher productivity, demonstrate three times higher creativity on the job, 10 times more engaged by their jobs, 37% higher sales, and are three times more satisfied with their jobs. And the thing that gets me excited about these statistics is that none of these are the result of some big motivational happening, like, oh, I got promoted. No. These results come from the frequency of day-to-day optimally motivating experiences. The phone call, the meeting, the simple you know, hallway interaction. So the more frequently people have optimally motivating experiences at work, the more likely you are to have these types of results. Okay, so if you'll notice the horizontal axis on this model is psychological needs, and psychological needs is what determines the quality of the motivation. So when psychological needs, the quality is low, motivation will be suboptimal. When psychological needs, the quality is high, then you will have aligned, integrated, or inherent motivation. So we need to understand what are psychological needs. There are three of them. And this, I think, is the most exciting piece of research um, that I've I've ever seen around motivation. What we've been able to, to determine is that every human being on the planet doesn't matter who you are, when you were born, what your race, creed, none of that matters. Every human being has three basic psychological needs. And when these three psychological needs are satisfied, you thrive. When these three psychological needs are thwarted or undermined, you cease to flourish. Does anyone know what the three biological needs are? That if we don't have our biological needs met, then we don't thrive. What are they? Biological needs. Okay. I heard food, water. Starts with an S, but it's not sleep. <laughs> it's sex. Huh? No, it's sex. No. If you ha- okay, but let's come back to self-esteem though in a minute. But. In, in order for the human race to thrive and to, to keep flourishing, we need to have water, food, and sex. Those are the big three biological needs. These three psychological needs are every bit as important to our thriving as those three biological needs. And in fact, when these three psychological needs are not being satisfied, we tend to abuse the biological needs. So, autonomy. We use babies, by the way, um, because even if you don't know the science, you can see these psychological needs in any baby. Have you fed a baby recently or in the past? When you're going to take that spoon and you're going towards his mouth, what does that baby do? He tries to grab the spoon, doesn't he? He doesn't even know how to find his mouth, but he wants control over what's going into it. Have you ever had a baby do this? Like, you know the baby's hungry. You come up with a spoon, and what does he do? He just shuts his mouth, and he, he won't open it for anything. And then he turns his head, right? And that's why he always has carrots along the side of his mouth. Because they want to control when and what's going into their mouth. So even at a very young age, we have the need to at least perceive that we have choices, that we have some control or volition over what is happening to us and what we are doing. Autonomy does not mean freedom. Let me say that again. Autonomy is not the same as freedom. It is the perception of choice. It is the perception of volition. So I think one of the best examples I've ever seen of um, autonomy was uh, written by Viktor Frankl in his book, Man's Search for Meaning. And Viktor Frankl, if you don't know the story, was in a World War II concentration camp where obviously they have no autonomy, right? Told when to get up, when to go to bed, when to do biological functions. Uh, Everything is, is dictated. And he writes about how in the mornings they would get them up, the prisoners up, 
before dark, I mean, excuse me, before light, so it was still dark. It was freezing outside. They, they weren't adequately clothed. They would chain them together, and they would march them to the labor camps to do labor. And they knew the rules, that if one of them fell, you couldn't help them up. If you tried to help someone up, then you would be beaten. Uh, that you just couldn't help your fellow man. So here's Viktor Frankl one morning. He's, he's walking along and trudging, and he's in pain, and people are falling and dying, and they're just leaving him the side of the road. And in the midst of that horror, he looks through the forest, and he happens to notice the sun rising through the trees. And in that instant, he looked through the forest, and he said, how beautiful. And then it, 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 it caught him that in the midst of this horror, he had noticed something of beauty. And he realized, they can't take that away from me. And in that moment, he started to think about what else they couldn't take away from him. And he realized he always had a choice. He could choose when the man in front of him fell down. He could choose to help that man up. And he could choose to be beaten. And so he decided to make that choice. He could choose when bread was being thrown and, and they were all starving and he got a piece of bread and the man next to him didn't get any. He could choose to share his bread with his fellow inmate. So he started making those types of choices. And at the end, that's why he wrote his book, because he realized the only people who truly thrived in that concentration camp were the people who understood that their autonomy could never be taken away. So I'd like you to imagine a workplace where people come to work every day because they choose to come to work. Not because they have to, but because they choose to. So a very, very different paradigm. Relatedness. Oh, so let me just back up one moment. We know how to help promote autonomy in the workplace, and we're going to leave you with some real um, specifics around that. But we also know how to kill it. We know how to destroy autonomy. And by the way, it's pressure. It's tension. Whenever we start applying pressure and tension, we think it works, it doesn't. People shut down. People are not at their best. You might see people working harder and faster, but they are making mistakes. The quality is not there. The productivity is not going to be as high. So when we use pressure and tension, it actually erodes people's sense of autonomy, and we're actually undermining the very productivity we're hoping to get. Okay, relatedness. We have a little girl, Brianna, reaching out for relatedness. Have you ever noticed how when a toddler is talking to you, but you're not looking at her, what does she do? She literally grabs your face, says, look at me, right? She wants to know that she's talking to someone who's there. That is our human need. We have a human need for relatedness. Relatedness is our need to care about people and be cared about by people. It is our need to find meaning in the work that we do. It is our need to feel that we're contributing to the greater good, that we are all connected, and when we feel that connection, it's something special. That is why we rally around sports groups. That's why we, we pledge allegiance to flags, is because that common bind, that common um, community is so ingrained in who we are. We are by nature social animals, which by the way is why social media is so amazing, right? So I'm doing a keynote speech um, one time in London, and it's for a major 50 company, which I will not name the company, but just before I went on to do my presentation, my host pulls me aside and she says, Susan, I just have to apologize. She says, you are the last speaker, and they've been here all week, and they are ready to get home. So you're the only thing standing between them and going home. And she says, all week, people have complained that it's just our culture, but people are always on their computers and their phones. They're just always, you know, multitasking. She says, so that's just our culture. It's not personal. Don't take it personal. So I'm thinking... Yeah, but it's me. They'll pay attention to me, right? And so I'm just even embarrassed saying that. I was so egotistical. So I walk out there, and I'm like, here I am, and I'm doing my speech. I do not have one person looking at me. 
I mean, they are all on their phones or on a computer. And so I feel like I'm just talking to the back wall. And finally, I'm so frustrated by it, I say, you know what, I'm going to do something drastic. And I've never done this. I've always heard of speakers who do this, but I had never tried it before. I just did this. I was like, even now doing this, it's so hard. I'm an extrovert. I need to... And I just stood there in silence until every single person looked up. It didn't work with this guy. He's on his phone. Um, anyway, <laughs> I'm just teasing. Do it. <laughs> because this is what I said to them, and I'll say the same thing to you. I said, what's going on? What is happening here? I said, listen. Your company flew me all the way from San Diego, California to speak to you for an hour because they thought I had something of value to say, but obviously you don't agree. So let me make a deal. Give me 10 minutes, and if I can't say anything of value in the next 10 minutes, go back to your phones, go back to your computer. I don't deserve your attention. And they're all sitting there like, wow. Except for this one guy who went right back to his computer. <laughs> so I go up to him and I, I, I said, um, excuse me, but um, is it, it's pretty important what you're doing. And he goes, well, I can multitask. And I said, well, you could if you were a woman. <laughs> Evidently, he was the right guy to pick on because everybody in the room laughed and started picking on him. And then I had their attention. And I just threw my speech out the window and I said, What's going on here? Let's just talk about this. And what we talked about was the phenomenon of social media and why it was important for everyone just to stay so connected. And, you know, what, what, what it does reflect is our need for relatedness. But what it doesn't do is um, talk about the type of connectedness we have. That a lot of people are getting into the external motivational outlook by saying, how many friends do you have? I know people who put a picture on Instagram and they get depressed because they don't get enough likes on it. And so, you know, it's like, uh, you know, how many LinkedIn connections do you have? And so we've started externalizing the very thing that was supposed to bring us um, closer together. So relatedness is important. Think about this in the workplace. We know how to build relatedness at work through meaningful work, through interpersonal relationships. We know how to do it, but we also know how to destroy it. And you know the best way to destroy relatedness at work is to focus on metrics without meaning. You know, we hear in organizations, metrics, metrics, metrics. And maybe you care about it because you're at the top of that pyramid. But if you don't help other people draw meaning, personal meaning, from the metrics you're asking them to achieve, then you have just eroded every bit of a relatedness in that organization. Third psychological need is for competence. And we show a little kid learning to walk. And I don't know if you've watched a child learning to walk or helped a child learning to walk, but it is the most glorious thing, isn't it? Isn't it fun? And you never ask, as they're learning to walk, you never ask, why do they fall? I mean, you know why they fall. They can't, they don't have the skill, they can't walk yet. But have you ever asked, why do they get up? And the reason they keep getting up is because it is in our nature to want to master the world around us. We want and need to learn and grow every single day. And think about when that child falls. They're so excited about learning this new skill, mastering this life skill, that when they get up, they're not crying. They're not saying, oh, I'm such a stupid baby. I can't even walk. No, what are they doing? They're laughing, and they start running before they can even walk, and they're full of joy. We all still have that need for competence. We all will still experience that joy. We know how to build competence in the workplace, but we also know how to destroy it. One of the first things that we dismiss in times of economic hardship is training. We don't necessarily, I'm listening again to the minister talking about cuts in education. We really need to understand that people learning and growing every single day is absolutely critical and important. So those are our three psychological needs, and to the extent that people's psychological needs are satisfied in the workplace, they will thrive. To the extent that they are undermined or thwarted, people in the workplace will not. 
Say again. What, what is it? So um, what he's saying is actualization. So you're getting that from Maslow's hierarchy. What I'd love for you all to do, this is going to sound really, forgive me, but you just opened the door for me, so I'm going to do it. Um, I, wrote, um, I wrote a blog for Harvard Business Review. So if you go on hbr.com, um, just type my name in, you'll find the, and it's what Maslow didn't teach us about motivation. And it had 75,000 hits on Thanksgiving Day last year. So it's, it's had hundreds and thousands of, um, not hits, but shares, hundreds of thousands of shares. And the thing that happened is that Maslow created this hierarchy that said at the top of the pyramid is actualization, self-actualization. So I'm really glad you brought this up because self-actualization can happen any time. You don't have to have all the needs in the pyramid satisfied in order to self-actualize. And so Maslow never meant for that pyramid to be taken at, to heart. He threw it out there. It was never proven. It's never been proven empirically. He never even believed in it. He just wanted, he's the one that really got us thinking about needs. And so what we know is that when people People will not self-actualize if these three basic psychological needs are not satisfied. But people can self-actualize if their biological needs are not satisfied. So you look at what was happening to Viktor um, Frankl. He was able to satisfy these psychological needs despite the hardships of not having enough food, enough water, or even the basic needs of security, safety, um, home, and health. So we, I think I'm really excited about this new research because what it's saying is your people at work can self-actualize every single day if we create an environment where their psychological needs are being satisfied. Can you, can you accept that? Please. He seems like a very interesting yeah. man, so I'm going to take advantage of this. Excuse me. I always wanted to be Oprah Winfrey. Oh, you have so, one. Yeah. Why am I running yeah, all this yeah. way? <laughs> oh, sorry, I need some exercise. Sorry, you have one. Can I get to see it's, you? It's, you need it, to shake your hand. It, okay. It, Relatedness. You, in Indian context, the autonomy here, which you are telling, is being misunderstood. Okay. Autonomy is linked with the organization, with the department with the company. When we talk autonomy, we, talk, we don't talk autonomy of the workman or the, uh, uh, the person working with us. I think it may so, be relevant in America, but not, uh, we, I mean, we never use this word autonomy as compared to the worker in the company. So you don't think that individuals have a need or a sense of autonomy? Pardon? So you don't think that individuals At have a need or a sense of autonomy? No, autonomy, we, uh, autonomy is relevant for the company, functioning of the company. You should be free from all the rules, regulations, all, everything. Mm. As far as the workman, he has to work under a code of conduct, under some rules. Well, I think what but I need he, for you to do is separate, I think, if I'm understanding what you're saying, we need to separate the, the idea of freedom from autonomy. It's not freedom, so, and it's not independence. See, and again, I'm going to just go back to Viktor Frankl's experience. Viktor Frankl did not have freedom, but he had autonomy because autonomy happens in here. So if I said to you, stand on your head right now, and you did it because you wanted to, that would be autonomy. But if you did it and you didn't want to, you wouldn't have autonomy. So autonomy is your feeling or your perception that you're choosing to do it because you're choosing to do it, not because someone's making you do it, not out of pressure. Is that making sense, y'all? It's a, it's, a, it's, it's a fine line. It's a fine line. But this is why a lot of um, people are afraid of autonomy because they, they think autonomy means independence or freedom, and it doesn't. Autonomy means something very different. It's a perception of choice. So somebody who says, I have to go to work, and I say, why do you have to go to work? Because I have to feed my family. I go, no, you don't. 
There's a lot of people who don't feed their families. Is that true? There are people every day who don't, who don't take care of their families, right? So if you're coming to work to feed your family, it's because you're choosing to do it. That's autonomy. But people don't have a sense of autonomy. They think, oh, I have to do it. Okay. That, we might have to think more about that. Did you? Hi. Are you taking my picture? <laughs> okay. Maybe this will come a little bit more clear um, in just a moment. But thank you so much for raising the, the, the point. So psychological needs, when, the high, when their quality is high, people can experience aligned, integrated, and inherent motivation. When the quality of psychological needs is low, people will be experiencing disinterested, external, or imposed motivational outlook. And um, I just want to uh, mention what's on the horizontal line here, which is self-regulation. And this is um, where you can shift between suboptimal to optimal by using self-regulation. And our research shows that the three most powerful strategies for experiencing optimal motivation and being able to shift is through mindfulness, values, and purpose. A young man named Kirk Warren Brown has done phenomenal research linking mindfulness with, with um, psychological needs. And so when you are mindful, it lights up the same part of your brain as when you're experiencing autonomy, relatedness, and competence. Okay? So mindfulness is when you are aware, you're in the present moment, but without judgment. Right? It's when, it's when you can be in the moment, but not be having an opinion about it. So that you can then... It's what actually happens is almost like taking a helicopter ride in your brain and getting above all the neural pathways of experience and being able to see that you have all these options. So when you're mindful, you're, you're automatically autonomous because now you don't have to do something. You have choices in front of you. I always think of the Indian culture as being the culture that's really taught the world about mindfulness. I think the way that you have thrived... Um, and is a country that has so many people and, and as acknowledged by the finance minister, so much poverty, was that people had the capacity to be mindful and to uh, rise above their uh, physical conditions. I think the sadness that I see is when cultures like yours tend to go in a direction where they're more externally focused and begin to lose that capacity to be mindful. Uh, so um, maybe I'm speaking out of turn. That's my opinion, my uh, outside um, impression. But if there's something you really want to hang on to in your culture, it would be this capacity for mindfulness because it is the most powerful tool for experiencing autonomy, relatedness, and competence. When we are mindful, as I said, we have other options and choices when we are mindful, we are in touch with our interconnectedness. We are aware of the welfare of the whole. When we are mindful, we are better able to access whatever skills we have to be able to cope more effectively in whatever with, with whatever we're dealing with. So pretty powerful, this idea of being mindful. And then aligning with values. How many of your organizations have a purpose statement and a set of values? Can I just see? Do, do most of them? Okay. And if I was to ask you, what are the values or the purpose of your organization, could you tell me? I'm not going to ask you because I don't want to put you on the spot, but could you tell me? Okay. okay, so do this. Right now, turn to the people at your table. I'm just going to give you probably two minutes to do this. And what I would like you, you can only take like 20 seconds apiece. I want you to share with each other, off the top of your head, what are your two primary values that you operate at work? Your two primary values for you at work. Share them with people at your table. Share them with the people at your table. Go around the table and just everybody very quickly... Say, here's my, val my two values. What are they? You're not sharing. 
You're choosing not to? <laughs> okay, I see some of you doing it and some of you not doing it. So the people who did not do it were being autonomous and choosing not to do it. And I hope the people who did it, did it because they wanted to. That's good. Okay. The reason I ask you to do that is because I, I see this phenomenon happening all the time where we have organizations that have determined what their values are and then we don't ask people within the organization, what are your values? And as leaders, have you really developed and thought about what your values are and how you make decisions every single day. So if you want, if you want a, a takeaway from today, I mean, I'm going to hope give you a few more, but go back and have values conversations with your people. Ask the people that report to you, what are your top three values that you bring to work every day? How do your values align with the values of the organization? Because if people do not understand what their values are, then it's very challenging to link whatever else they're doing to values. So let me just give you an example. I think I've done a pretty good job in my life of creating a job, a career, that I'm optimally motivated to do. I love to do research. I love to write. I love to speak. I love to travel. I love to talk to people. Do you know what I don't love doing? Going through security at the airport. I don't care what you do. I'm never going to love that, okay? It's never going to be fun. Now, because of my personality type, I always want to get everywhere I'm going as fast as I can get there. I'm, I'm very impatient. That's my, my basic nature. And so when I get to security, I'm looking to see which line is moving fastest. And I'm going to get into the fastest line. That means a line with no families or children, and it oftentimes means a line without a lot of men because men don't carry purses and so they have to take everything out of their pockets and, you know, it just takes, you know, every, it just takes longer, right? So I am like getting into the fastest line. And then it turns out it's always, you know, the, the security camera breaks down or something and then I go, oh, I should have gone to that other line. So I'm always full of stress and angst. So one day I'm all looking which line I should get in and I'm thinking, Susan, practice what you teach. You need to shift your motivation here. What, what value do you have that you could actually align with going through security? And I thought, you know, I really value helping people. I value being of service. So I thought maybe I could help somebody. So I purposely got into a line with a family. Now, I also had another value, and that was to try to become more patient. That's another. So I thought, okay, this will do both. If I'm in a line with a family, maybe I can help the family, and I'll become more patient. So this family is getting all their stuff out, and they've got a toddler, you know, a, a young kid just learning to walk, and a newborn baby. Okay, and they got all the stuff. And so I'm kind of trying to help them put it up on the conveyor belt, and they're struggling. And finally, I say, you know, I hope you don't think this is weird, but I really love holding babies. Would it be helpful if I held your baby while you get through security? And they go, oh, would you? And I said, yeah. So now I'm like holding this baby, and I just love holding babies. It was just wonderful. So they're, they're going through security, and I go, excuse me, do you want your baby? Oh, yeah. Okay, they, they get their baby, and they go through. On the other side of security, I help them. You know, I'm holding the baby, helping them. And then they go off, I go off. And I'm thinking, wow. That was actually fun. I helped people. I got to hold a baby. I, you know, being patient wasn't that hard. This was really cool. And then I got to, to where the gate was, and the man comes up to me, and he says, excuse me, he says, we were, you know, so preoccupied. We've never traveled with, you know, our newborn and with this young child, and, and we just didn't even know what we were doing, and I, I didn't even thank you. He says, I don't think we could have gotten through security without you. Thank you. Wow, 
you know? And so now I have to tell you, every time I go through security, I have an aligned motivational outlook. I'm able to say, wow, I'm working on my patience. I'm able to help people. I'm actually living my values. If you don't know what your values are, if you don't have values that are developed and are, are conscious, it's really hard to do that. It's really hard to say, what is it that I'm doing here that I'm suboptimally motivated by, and how do I shift by linking to values? if I don't have values. So have those conversations with your people at work. And then connecting to purpose. There is nothing that creates a higher degree of quality energy than having a noble purpose and acting from a noble purpose and being able to connect whatever you're doing through that noble purpose. Charles Garfield, years and years ago, wrote a book called Peak Performers. And in that book, he had interviewed thousands of people that he deemed to be peak performers. He was uh, in San Francisco. He was living in San Francisco. And one day, he, you know, he's in the middle of his research, and he was driving across one of the bridges in San Francisco that had a toll. So he's going through the toll booth, and um, he hears loud music. And he's going, wow, I've never noticed loud music like this before. And he, he gets to the toll booth, and he rolls down his window uh, further, and notices that the loud music is coming from the booth that he's about to go through. And then just as he's going through the booth, the toll booth operator comes out of the booth, and he's singing, and he's dancing to the music. And he sings this little song like, Hey man, give me your 50 cents and be on your way. I hope you have a great day. And Garfield is just like laughing, and he's like, Whoa, that's, that's wild. And he gives the guy his money, and he drives off, and Garfield realizes... That was a peak performer toll booth operator. I need to interview that guy. So he gets the information, and he goes back, he finds the guy, and he interviews him. And he says, uh, Garfield says, I've never had a toll booth operator like you before. What's your story? And the toll booth operator says, well, actually, I am a musician and an actor, but I don't have a gig right now, so I had to take this job. He says, and I was talking to my coworkers, and they, were, they would uh, refer to the toll booth as a vertical coffin. And he says, and I didn't want to go to work every day in a vertical coffin. He says, so I decided my life purpose is to entertain. It doesn't matter where I am. Wherever I am is a stage. That is connecting to purpose. That's saying whatever your job is, whatever task you've been delegated, whatever goals you're being asked to achieve, you can somehow tie that or link it to a more noble purpose. That really has meaning. So I would be willing to bet that most of the people that you have at work know what your organization's purpose is, but not have a clue what their own is. And those are conversations we need to have. Those are conversations we need to have. So, in this model, it is descriptive because it describes six motivational outlooks whose quality depends on psychological needs. And the model is prescriptive because it tells people how to shift from suboptimal to optimal through the three MVPs of self-regulation. I'd like to share with you an example, a case study, I guess, um, of, of how this worked. Imagine um, 350 sales reps in a room, and I do that opening activity like we did. The prize in this particular case was an iPad mini, and the 350 pharmaceutical sales reps were so excited about that iPad mini. I mean, they were just jumping up and down, screaming, and in the end the young man who won the iPad was named Mohammedan uh, because I was actually in the Middle East and, and these were people from all over the Middle East. And Mohammedan was so excited about that iPad mini that he runs up on the stage to grab it and at the same time he grabs my microphone. As a speaker, you're never supposed to let somebody grab your microphone but I didn't have a lot of choice, he just kind of took it. And he started singing. Turns out the Mohammedan was a pharmaceutical sales rep by day, but a singer by night. So I don't know how to sing in Arabic. I don't know if anybody else here does, but it kind of sounded to me like, and then he would do this, 
And they would all start singing. And so it was like he was singing, they were singing, it was back and forth, people were up and they were dancing, and it was wild. It was so exciting. It was really fun. So finally I got my microphone back and I went on. It was a full day training. And so we were working on this and they were doing exercises and developing the skill of motivation. And I thought it was going really, really well. And at lunch, the managing director of the region, who is kind of a scary man anyway, a little intimidating, and he comes up to me and he says, Susan, we have a problem. I said, what? And he goes, Mohammedan. I said, what do you mean? He goes, he cheated. I said, what do you mean he cheated? Well, when you're doing that activity, he was yelling out the wrong answers, but he stayed standing anyway. And then it just so happens that at the end, he, he won. And I said, well, how do you know? And the director said, he told me. I said, well, why would he tell you that? He says, because he feels so guilty. And I went, oh, good. I said, let me talk to him. So I talked to Mohammedan. He told me his story. And I said, Mohammedan, after lunch, would you be willing to go back up on stage and share with people what you just shared with me? And he was so nervous that he actually wrote out his confession on a piece of paper. And he came up on the middle of the stage, and he's standing there. He's a big guy, and he's shaking as he reads his confession. And he explains how he was in the external motivational outlook because he wanted that iPad mini so bad. But he also wanted to be the life of the party. He wanted the status and the acclaim that would come from winning. And he wondered why, when he got back to his seat, he wasn't as excited about the iPad mini as he thought he would be. And then he realized, through the model, that it was because he hadn't self-regulated, that he allowed himself to not live by his own values or the values of the organization for, for integrity and honesty. And that for that reason, he was ashamed, and that's why he felt guilty, and he was experiencing suboptimal motivational outlook. He was, he was experiencing now the imposed motivational outlook, feeling guilty, shameful, afraid of having disappointed people in himself. And for that reason, he wanted to give the iPad mini back. At the end of his confession, 350 people stood up and gave him a standing ovation. And we did the activity again and gave the iPad to someone else who was really deserving. But for me, that was one of those seminal moments when someone recognizes what they're going through, what they're experiencing, and they have a model, they have an explanation for it, and then can take action to shift and do the right thing so that they can actually feel what it feels like to be optimally motivated. All right? So I'd like for you to, to have um, a, a bit of that experience, too. Um, so I'd like you to think about what's become clear to you about motivation, about engagement, about psychological needs, um, about the practices that you use in your own organizations as a leader or with yourself as an individual. So what's become clear, or maybe just the opposite, what's become more muddy for you? And on the, in the brochure that we handed out, there are some questions in that center. Um, and those questions are just suggestions. But what I'd like for you to do is at your tables with each other, could you um, determine what question do you still have about motivation? What challenge do you have? What would be helpful for you to get in the time that we still have together? And so if you would at your tables talk about these ideas and what questions do you still have or what information do you really need so you can leave Mind Rush and this session feeling like you can do something differently starting immediately. All right? So I'm going to give you five minutes at your tables uh, to come up with at least one question that you would like to ask. It might be the question that's in the brochure or it could be a very different question. Okay? But come up with one that you all agree on. All right? So five minutes to do that, please. Okay, who has a question? Oh, good, there's some back here. Do we have a microphone back there? I'm not going to run all that way this time. I've learned. <laughs> okay, good.
We have the microphones, they just don't, aren't on. Oh, there it is, okay. Hello. Thank you so much. Uh, we were very interested in uh, question number five, when you were talking about best practices. Uh, and what, what came to our mind was if you could uh, bring it connected with cultural context. Because uh, you have to bring motivation and you have to bring behavior and align it, align it to a particular context, otherwise it will be out of place. And so, if you could okay. kindly reflect on that, on uh, best practices in a culturally uh, context, say India, for example, at this point. So, so let's look at two things. One is to remember that people's need for autonomy, relatedness, and competence, which, by the way, I'm going to call ARC, A-R-C, just for ease, is beyond culture. Okay, so that's, those are just human needs that don't have a cultural context. But... The way you satisfy ARC might be in a cultural context. So um, what I would encourage people to do in terms of best practices is to look, first of all, take ARC. How can we encourage autonomy? All right? Well, one of the ways you could encourage autonomy is, and, I, and tell me if this would be culturally sensitive or, or appropriate, is that rather than saying to people, here are your goals... You have to have this accomplished by this time. Instead, be able to say to people, this is the outcome that we need by a certain date. And I'm giving you this information as a way to help you succeed. Here are milestones. Here are, here's data. Here's information that can help you be successful. In other words, instead of imposing goals on people, what we can do is give people information that enables them to be more successful. If I could just give you a, a, a personal example where this just happened to me recently. Um, uh, we've got, my book is here called Why Motivating People Doesn't Work and What Does. I've written six, seven books. This has been by far the most powerful, wonderful experience I've ever had as an author. And the reason is because my publisher, Barrett Kohler, decided that they were going to be a different kind of publisher, that they wanted to actually create a relationship with their authors. So every other publisher I've ever worked with has said, here's your deadline, you have to have your manuscript in by this time or else, you know? And then you're writing and they've got all this pressure and there's a lot of this angst. What Barrett Kohler did was they flew me to San Francisco, had me meet with all of their departments. Anybody who was going to touch my book over the next two years, I had individual meetings with those teams, with those people. And they gave me a whole outline of the production schedule for my book, and it showed where I had certain milestones I had to make, and it showed me where everybody else's um, deadlines were. And what they said is, Susan, here's the process for your book coming to fruition, and here's everybody's role, and here's what your responsibilities are within this context. I never once felt like they were throwing a deadline at me. I felt like it was part of a team, and that I had a responsibility, and that all of that was information that gave me the choice that I said, I want to make my timelines, because I now understand how what I do impacts everybody else. Too often we're setting goals, and we're not putting them in the context that helps people understand that the reason we have those goals is, to, is, is data, is information so that we can be successful. So that's, just, that's one example. What I'd encourage you to do is to say, okay, how do we encourage autonomy? So, so giving information is, is data rather than, than deadlines and, you know, I'm going to hold you accountable for this. By the way, people hate being held accountable. People love being accountable. There's a huge difference. A huge difference. Okay. Um, so, and then how do you build um, relatedness? Uh, you know, I think having conversations, I think, especially within the Indian culture, being able to tell stories, um, giving people examples from your own history or from um, uh, other people. Ooh, that didn't sound good, did it? Anyway. <laughs> um, so uh, building relatedness uh, within your culture I, it depends on how you do that but I think being able to talk about feelings I don't care what culture you're in 
People have feelings. People are making decisions based on feelings. You cannot ignore them. I know that you know, in a lot of organizations, the F word is feelings. And we need to change that. I don't care what your culture is. And then we need to um, build competence. And I think one of the ways that you do that is through training, is making sure that training has a focus, that education has a focus. Those are some best practices. Here's a little best practice. See if this would work. At the end of every day, when you're talking to the people that report to you, instead of asking, okay, what'd you get done today? Okay, how close are you to achieving your goals? What if at the end of every day you asked this simple question? What did you learn today? What did you learn today that's going to help make you better tomorrow? How did you grow today that might help someone else be better tomorrow? If we just started asking questions about growth and learning, what the research shows is that people are learning something every day, but because we don't talk about it, they don't realize it. So they're not experiencing that joy that that little kid experiences when they get up after falling and they're learning to walk. What if you promoted mindfulness? What if you simply asked people questions like, right now, how are you feeling about this goal? Right now, what, where are you in this process? If we simply asked simple questions, the most powerful question in the world that you can ask an individual is why. So if you said to me, Susan, you really hate going through security. Why is that? I said, because I get impatient and I have... Why do you get impatient? Well, because that's my nature. Why is that your nature? Well, it's just the way I was born. Well, why, why do you think that that's so important? You know, well, I don't think it's important. I think I, could, I don't have to live that way. All of a sudden, I start, I start kind of shifting. Let me give you an example of the power of why. Um, young man named Sonny. We asked him um, what he, why he was motivated to be in sales. And he said, money. And I said... Why are you so motivated by money? And he said, because I don't have any. And I said, why don't you have any? He says, because I just got through school, and I, I'm broke, and I don't have any money. I said, why is money so important to you? And he says, because I have to buy things. I said, why do you need to buy things? He says, because I, I need things, like a car. I said, why do you need a car? He says, well, I've got a car. He says, I need a better car. I said, why do you need a better car? He says, because a, a car is your image. Your car is who, who you are. He lives in Southern California. You are what you drive, right? And I said, well, why is that so important? And then he stopped, and he said, wow, I never thought about this before. But the reason that's so important is because my parents worked two jobs each in order to put me through school. I'm the first person in my family to ever graduate from college. And I don't want them to see me as, as not worth it. Now, that could be the imposed motivational outlook. And I said, so why is it so important that you seem worth it? And he says, because I love them and I'm so grateful. Now, that's relatedness. I said, Sonny, do you see why getting up every day out of love and gratitude is a different way of getting up rather than getting up every day because you've got to make money? He never really thought about why he needed the money. But as soon as I started asking why, 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 he got to something deeper, richer, and more meaningful. So I think this is a culture where you could have those kind of conversations about, you know, why do you want to be a doctor? Why do you want to be an engineer? Why do you want to do this job? It's a powerful, powerful... We, we actually teach that in our, in our course. We teach how to have a motivational outlook conversation and to ask, use the power of why to get to the heart. And why is a mindfulness tool. It's helping someone to be more mindful, to get out of all their expectations and all that other stuff and get to something that's foundational, which is autonomy, relatedness, or competence. And then, I th I, as I said earlier, I think that you can align with values, but you have to have the values conversation. And I think you could connect to purpose, but you have to have the purpose com conversation. So everything that's in that model, the autonomy, relatedness, and competence, the mindfulness, values, and purpose, those are all actionable items. Those are all actionable things that you go back and start doing immediately, having those conversations, taking actions to help people become aware of them. Did that help at all, or is that... You sure? Okay. Yes.
Thank you very much, Susan, for the really motivational talk. <laughs> but is it uh, suboptimally or optimally <laughs> motivating? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I have um, maybe a different question. I was working uh, 20 years in the West, and I really recognize your concept. The employees we had, all the motivational, pro uh, motivational programs, it works fantastic. The last eight years, I work here in India, and I need a kind of different program, because people are so really motivated, high vibe, like to do everything, a lot of ideas, speeding up the innovations, very smart, so once in a week, I have to create a kind of speed breaker. Please, calm down. So my question to you is, do you have also demotivational programs? <laughs> Sorry about that. Do you know, I, I can understand what you're saying, and this, this, do you mind, I, I'm just being, um, I might be a little bit risky here in my response, and you can come up later and tell me about how I put my foot in my mouth, and, and that'll be okay. I, I, the last time I was in India, I did um, a three-day training course for a group of uh, plant managers, engineers, plant workers. And I found the same thing, okay? Just that enthusiasm, that, you know, all the ideas flowing. And so we stopped and talked about it. And what was, I think aha moment for a lot of them in that room was when I started asking them why they had that kind of energy or why they were invested in that. And what a lot of them began to realize was a lot of it was socially imposed or was imposed by their parents or it was an expectation of a certain way that they should be, but that it actually in many cases was causing a lot of stress and anxiety. And so I don't care... It, it, when we think that people, we can't gauge, here's what I'm going to say, as leaders or as individuals, as parents, as colleagues, we cannot gauge if the motivation a person has is suboptimal or optimal without the conversation. It's not going to be from their outside behavior. And the reason that we have so much mental health issues and physical health issues is because we have people who are acting on expectations of others and haven't really gone deep into what their own motivations are for doing what they're doing. And it turns out that a lot of it is about status. A lot of it is about uh, meeting other people's expectations, and it's not healthy. And, and it turns out that all of that flurry of ideas isn't necessarily helpful. Is, that, is this making sense? It's, it, you still have to have that conversation. And don't assume that because you've got all of that, that they're optimally motivated. Does, is that a fair statement? For I see some heads nodding. I think there's a huge expectation culturally for children to excel in certain areas. And I think that a lot of children do it um, for parents, but have never really thought about if they're doing it for themselves as well. And then, okay. Here, here's your microphone. It is with regard to this, what has become oh. clear for me, it Just is minute. something which has not be become clear. Okay. So can you please go to the slide, we're talking about the psychological needs. Yep. I think. Okay, no, stop here, yeah, like yeah, yeah, this is good. Oh, this one or the, or no, the, the other one? No, the other one, yeah. yeah. No, the one after that. Oh, the self-regulation? No, this one. Okay. Now, I've been thinking since quite some time when this slide, the middle one, aligned with values was there, and I, to be honest, could not actually put my finger on. Okay. Then you gave me, or you gave us your related experience with your security checkups. Yeah, yeah. Right? And how it did not match with your values and how you wanted to align that. So then it struck me that I may be wrong, maybe you may have to explain to me once again, but if supposing we write align my values instead of with values, will that make more sense? Because otherwise with values becomes a very huge wide value areas in your environment. It can be with your neighbors, around your and how will you align everybody every time for your motivation? Well, the reason we have aligned values, I, I, I appreciate your point, and I don't disagree with it. Let me share with you why we have aligned, 
is because we're finding that so many employees in organizations have not thought about their own values that maybe the first step is they need to align whatever they're doing, whatever the work they're doing is, to the values of the organization, and then go from there. So um, I do a lot of work with a company called WD40 in San Diego. And WD40 company is a very values-based organization whose values are very, very clear. And their experience there has been that people who don't have strong uh, they have programmed values. Everyone has values, by the way. But a lot of them are programmed. The programmed values from parents, from our generation. Uh, you know, when we talk about uh, Gen Xers and baby boomers, all of that's programmed values, right? So people have programmed values that they might not be aware of consciously. And so when they go into an organization, maybe the best first step is for them to align to the organization's values and then to start to explore that. And then to say, okay, what are my values? And then if you, got, if you get um, delegated a task or a goal, what you're really doing is you're aligning the task or goal with either your values or the values of the organization. But I think it will be the other way around because before you go to your career graph anytime, you have your childhood and youth before that. And that's where you start building your values given to you by your parents, your friends, or whoever, your teachers. And you don't take those small steps in the beginning to understand my values ingrained into me by my surroundings. How will I be able to make the right choices at my career stage when I go there, when I'm getting further confused with so, all the other values that so I have? So I think that what, I think what maybe we're saying the same thing, but maybe different, is that you have to say with values in the beginning <laughs> so that you know. have them. I, I yeah, yeah, yeah. By the way, when I talk about value, having the aligned values or with values, the values I'm talking about have characteristics. They are chosen, so they're conscious. They're chosen. They're chosen from among alternatives. They are chosen from among alternatives with an understanding of what the implications are for that choice. And they're prized and they're cherished and they're acted upon over time. So there's actually criteria that we need to teach people on how to develop a value and what a developed value actually looks like. Once we've done that work, then we can align with values. But I think what you're saying, and I agree with you, is that there's a lot of work that needs to be done before that happens. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. One more question. Yeah. And then I'll be glad to stick around afterwards. Oh, okay. Two. Can I have... Where am, where's my timer? Okay, because we've got a time... For, Okay, you one know, more we question. We have some then. time for a is, couple of questions. I, I wanted to, is, well, I if I just may uh, request everyone to keep their questions short, crisp, and to the point. Well, please. actually, it's me that needs to keep it short, crisp, is, and to is, the point. <laughs> yeah. is, is motivation a relative term? Oh, I'm sorry. Varying from person to person, place to place, and sector to sector. I'm sorry, because I was looking over here, and I missed the first part of your question. Is, moti is motivation a relative term? which varies from place to place, person to person, country to country, and sector to sector. Because the motivation in government is different from motivation in the private sector. The motivation in public sector undertaking is different from motivation uh, from the government. Suppose... How are you uh, defining motivation? For, for example, uh, I'm telling, when my father gave me a bicycle, I was very happy, and, I, I, and gave me a watch, I was very happy, and I started studying better. But when I'm giving a car to my son, he is not happy. He is saying, buy me, a, buy me a costly car. Can I just say that one of my most unfavorite words is happy. Okay? I know we use happy all the time, but happy is relative. And there's different qualities of happiness. The goal is not happiness. I could be happy because you lose. I could be happy you know, because somebody dies. I could be happy for horrible reasons. So happy is not the goal, and happy and motivation are not the same thing. Okay? So what I want you to focus on is the quality of the experience that a person is having. If I was to ask you, why were you happy when you got the bicycle? Why isn't your son happy when he gets a bicycle? Why, you know, it's the why is what's important. It's not that somebody's happy and somebody's not happy. It's why. Okay, and until we start understanding that and whether or not 
um, uh, the, the motivation is optimal or suboptimal, then, then happiness, it's, it's, it's just a, it's just a, it's a throwaway term. And okay, yes, but you know what? I have ahead. a closing, and I and you're up here, so I, I can I do. Oh, my don't fret. No, no, I'm just here to help you with the questions. I know. Yeah, please go ahead, sir. Hello. Oh, who am I looking at? Hello. Okay. So, does I know I want to be a business fund. These are great questions. So, does this apply at the top level too? Like generally, the company's goal or the CEO's goal is to provide maximum value to its shareholders. So, oh. which is sort of an external motivation. I have to tell you. Um, I just spoke to 750 people whose job is to create the, the GMAC test that gets people into master's programs in universities. And the thing that we're so distraught about is that MBA programs are putting people out into the world, leaders who are focused on external motivation, who don't even understand psychological needs, who don't understand human thriving in the workplace. And then we have CEOs and top-level leaders who think it's all about shareholder, you know, ROI and all that stuff. And what our research shows so, so clear. We have white papers on this, by the way. And Vandana, you want to just stand up real quick? If Vandana's here, and she can get you white papers. They're free based on our, our research, published research um, at the, from the Ken Blanchard companies that shows that when CEOs focus on the vitality of the organization, on ROI, shareholder return, all of those things that they lose. That the fastest way to not get the results you want is to focus on the results. But the CEOs, the leaders who understand that the way you get those results is through people who have employee work passion or through customers who have devotion to the organization or to the brand, that if, the fo if that's where your focus is, Vitality is a byproduct. Profit is a byproduct of having an engaged workforce. And until we understand that, we're going to ha keep having turnover of CEOs and leaders, and we're going to have companies that are doing this because they simply are focusing on... It's like, it's like a great athlete who keeps his eye on the scoreboard instead of in the game. And that's, that's the shift that we really need to make with people. I'm sorry about that. That makes me... Excited. <laughs> one, one. Okay. Susan, last question. Okay. Uh, so this is not a question. Uh, this is to thank you. You know, I read your book about a year ago, and I forced the India Today, you know, Kali, to get you here uh, as well, too, so that I thought it, it was great to share the experience I had reading the book. It changed my life. I changed the way I operate in my company. It, I mean, to the point of even losing weight and keeping it there, because I think you know. I had a lot, many other motivations, which was when one achieved, I didn't know what to do. And once I read the book, I don't know if this is a spoiler alert and people don't buy that, is coming down to the basis and making my motivation now relevance. To be relevant. Is that a spoiler alert? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> so, but it, every time now that I move, you know, it, it's very easy to make a decision because being aware of why am I doing this, that mindfulness, Always making sure that I'm not taking a decision because there might be other factors, but because they align the values. For example, if I believe that there's no use hurting somebody, you know, not hurting him emotionally, so I don't take that decision anymore. All this has really helped, and I really, really wanted to thank you. So, thank you very much. Well, that was worth the trip. Thank you. I would like to talk to you afterwards, if I might. Oh, it made more than my day. It made more than my day. I need to close because I want to honor our next speaker and, and the work that's been done here. I wanted to just share a final um, story, and I, I'm going to fast forward through a couple of slides here. Just let me do this real quick. Um, I, and this is a personal story. I just wanted to end with this because I, I wouldn't be standing here without this experience. Um, this is Alexa. She's my stepdaughter, and this was a picture of her when she was in high school, uh, played for the high school volleyball team. 
And that year, I went to every single volleyball game. I rearranged my whole travel schedule and everything so that I could be there to support her. And this particular game was really important because if, if Alexa's team won, they would go to the state championships. If her team lost, then it would be the end of her volleyball career because she wasn't going to play volleyball after high school. So it was a very exciting game, and I don't know if you've ever gotten involved in your children's sporting or athletic events, but parents tend to get a little overzealous, and uh, we're yelling and screaming in the stands, and it's really um, gets to a point where it's very tense because Alexa's team won the first game. The other team, her crosstown rival, won the second uh, game, and whoever won the third game would win everything. Alexa gets up to serve, and her team is behind badly. And my stomach is in knots. And she gets up there to serve, and I'm like shutting my eyes, and all of a sudden I hear a cheer because they get a point. And she serves again, point. Serves again, another point. All of a sudden, Alexa's team is ahead, and they go on, and they win the game, and it is so exciting, and I am yelling and screaming, and, and I have to tell you, I am really, really quick, and I flew down the bleachers to get to Alexa. I still have the 50-yard record at Shaw Heights Junior High School. I am fast. My husband, who is also very athletic, but not nearly as fast as I am, somehow he beat me. <laughs> And I, to this day, I do not know how he got to Alexa before I did. But he was there. His name is Drea Zagarmi. He's Italian. And he's got his arms around Alexa, and he's doing his Italian dad thing, where he's kissing her on the forehead, <laughs> hugging her. And I'm going, come on, come on, come on. It's my turn. Let me in there. And finally, he steps back, and I think, okay, it's my chance to get in there. And he steps back, and he's got his arms or his hands on her shoulders, and he, and he won't let me in. And he looks at her. He looks at Alexa. He goes, Alexa, I noticed that when you got up to do your serve, your team was down by seven points. But by the time you finished your serve, your team was ahead, and you went on to win the game. How did you feel about your serve? And what, you've got to be kidding me. People are yelling and screaming and celebrating, and here he is having this serious conversation with Alexa. And then I noticed something in Alexa's eyes that I had never noticed before. They were glowing. And she was, got real animated. She's a very introverted girl, but she got really animated. And she says, Dad, Dad, you know how much I hated practicing my serve, and I had to go to camp this summer, and I just hated it, and I wanted to quit. And then I got up there tonight, and I knew my team needed me, and I threw that ball in the air, and as soon as I hit that overhead smash and I saw the movement on the ball, I knew there was no way they would get it. Dad, it was marvelous. It was wonderful. It was the best night of my whole life. I helped my team win. Dad, it doesn't get better than this. And I stood there watching this young woman transform in front of me. And I thought, wow. What would have happened had I gotten to Alexa before Drea did? What would the conversation have been all about had I gotten to Alexa first. That conversation would have been about my experience. It would have been about how excited I was. It would have been about how proud I was of her. That conversation would have been all about me. But what Drea did in his moment of wisdom was he gave Alexa the power of autonomy. She had the choice of how she was going to remember that night and how she still remembers it to this day. He gave her the gift of relatedness because he obviously cared more about her experience than his own. And he gave her the gift of competence because I can tell you that before that moment, I don't think she had ever made the connection between hard work and outcome, effort and results. And had I gotten to Alexa before Drea did, I would have robbed her of all of that. That's when I understood the power that we have as parents, as teachers, as leaders, to help create that environment where people can experience their psychological needs, 
where they can thrive because of what's inside of them. So I know I'm really behind. I just have a very, very short little video that they're going to run. It's less than a minute. But as they show it, what I'd like to ask you to think about in context of what we've been discussing is as you watch little Evie, what do you notice about her motivation? All right, so if you'd run the video. Baby, sad time. Now, what you might have noticed and responded to with Evie's example there was her obvious intention and her total focus, the way that she didn't get upset when the blocks fell, she didn't start hurling them across the room, she just mindfully kept performing and, and engaging in her goal. And you might have noticed what was missing. There was no, come on, Evie, you can do it. Do it for mommy. There was no, oh, daddy's so proud of you. There were no rewards, no incentives, no trinkets, no bonuses. What you've witnessed with Evie is in our nature. In probably the most important understanding of human motivation in history, what we really now understand is that it is our human nature to thrive. Nobody wants to be bored Nobody wants to be disingenuous. Nobody wants to be disengaged. Nobody wants to be lazy. No one wants to not make a contribution. It's in our nature to thrive. And now we have the understanding of how to create human thriving in our schools, in our organizations, in our homes, and in our communities. And I think the real reason I came all the way to India was to ask you this. What's stopping us? Let's help people thrive through optimal motivation. And I thank you for being here because the reason you're here is because you're obviously intending to do good work. And I appreciate that, and I think it's a privilege that I'm here to speak to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.